Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our service to you in Leicester, those of you with us in person and watching online. Can I repeat the normal words of caution about wearing masks throughout the service, maintaining social distancing and if you wish to leave an offering please do so in the boxes at the doors on the way out. Our thanks to Marion for playing for us this morning. There will be a private family funeral for Richard Rothery, which on Monday next week. We ask that you please continue to hold Pam and the family in your thoughts and prayers at this sad time. There will be coffee mornings next week on Tuesday behind the Fletcher Hall in East Salton and Wednesday in the Man's Garden in Gifford, both at 10.30. Everyone is very welcome to attend, but please do call in advance Janet for Salton and Alison for Gifford, as we're still restricted to 12 people in the current situation. Our service next Sunday will be in Bolton at 10 a.m. And again, please, as usual, get in touch with Paul Sales by Friday evening if you wish to attend. Lothian Presbytery is once again offering a training course for everyone interested in leading worship. This will take place later in the summer with online meetings and if restrictions so permit, also in person for those who would prefer that method. The course will focus on the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles on this occasion and is suitable for those who have done a previous course as well as those who haven't and wish to undertake the training for the first time. If you would be interested in participating, please speak to Aniko for the relevant details. These are all today's intimations. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good morning. Good morning. Very nice to see you all here this morning. The prophet Micah writes, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Let us worship God. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 124. Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
God, we gather today in hope and expectation. We come to you as we are, joyful, tired, grateful, anxious, and always in awe of your mercy. Our needs are filled in your love, and we lay at your feet our whole being, everything we are and everything we have. We gather together today alongside your followers all over the world to thank you, pray to you, praise you, our God, our guide, our way, our life, our truth. Though our walls may crumble, we remember that we, your people, are built on a solid foundation of rock and through your love we will never fall. We gather, enveloped by your Holy Spirit, drawn close to you and to each other in praise and thanksgiving, spurred into action by your life-giving presence, emboldened to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to preach your Holy Word to the world. We gather as one body, sometimes strong, sometimes weak, seeking to do your work, Praying for forgiveness when we fail to do what we can to live as you have told us. Asking for support when we falter from the path of love for all. We ask for boldness to live in your example. For courage and hope to give ourselves wholly to your service. So that we may always, in all we do, praise you and love your people. Ever-loving God, we come before you in awe, in wonder at your works, praising your holy name this day and every day. As we pray together in the words you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now hear our readings, and after that we have a few minutes of music for our own reflections. My first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, reading from chapter 2 and the first five verses. <clears throat> it's the vision of the scroll. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. When he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And a New Testament reading taken from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, and the first 13 verses. And it's the resurrection of Jesus, the rejection of of Jesus at Nazareth and the mission of the Twelve. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? 
what deeds of power are being done by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honour, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called to the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May God bless these readings of his holy word, and his name be all glory and praise. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Do you ever get that feeling of time just moving too fast? Perhaps when you see people whom you have known growing up, perhaps even remember them being born, and now they have their own families and are, by all accounts, adults themselves. I experienced that feeling quite recently when we were back on Iona and one of the girls who had been five or six years old when I, when I worked on the island was now back at the Abbey leading the program for the week and a boy whom I used to babysit after I moved to Edinburgh 
was at the Camus Outdoor Center as a grown-up volunteer. And seeing them now, not much younger than I was when I worked on the island, I don't find it entirely effortless to reconcile these young people with their uni degrees and ready to embark on the world with the children I have known. Do you ever find it difficult to keep up, as it were, with a person's actual stage of life, if you've known them when they were very young? Or do you always see them as the child they were when you first met them? And in turn, as you were growing up, did you find yourself ever patronized in a similar way? Or indeed not seen as yourself at all? but simply designated as Maggie's granddaughter or the Smith boy rather than a person in your own right. Of course, when we act like that, it's usually not out of any bad intention. It's simply human nature, I suspect. And so what we hear in the Gospel reading today about how Jesus is received in Nazareth, the town where he grew up, as perhaps not so surprising. The people who listen to him in the synagogue are the neighbors who have seen him grow up, who know him as the oldest boy of Joseph, the carpenter, and Mary, his wife. They might remember him as a little boy playing the occasional prank, or the one who would always try to help Joseph in his workshop with his own little pretend tools made from sticks or the one who had got lost one time in Jerusalem at the Passover festival. In short, they know young Jesus, which family he belongs to, and who he was as a boy. He has changed, however. He has grown up. He has traveled. He has seen much more than many of them will have during their longer lifespan. But for them, he is still young Jesus who left some time ago, young and inexperienced. It's hard for them to reconcile this man who now is acting the teacher in the synagogue with that young boy they had known. It's such a human story and I'm sure many of us can relate to it. And so the people in the synagogue in Nazareth that day don't want to listen to the preaching of young Jesus. Nevertheless, they see what he has done. They recognize the wisdom in what he is saying. They see the healing he brings. But yet they can't bring themselves to accept him as an authority. Jesus moves on, disappointed and perhaps a bit hurt too. He now gives instructions to his followers about how to go about their work elsewhere, spreading the word about God's love for the world and the invitation to everyone to change their lives accordingly so that they may partake in the living out of this love. He tells them that they won't need much to go about their work. No ropes, chalices or buildings, not even simple provisions. Well, quite a bit has changed in the way we do church. And of course, for us, it is helpful to have a place to meet together, to have symbols of our faith in the chalice and plate, the baptism font. It can occasionally even be handy to have a minister's uniform to indicate our ministry, for instance, when visiting hospitals or care homes. But if we stripped it all away, would we still be able to worship? Would we still be able to serve God? Well, aren't we doing that anyway, all week long, in between our Sunday services? After all, we are not only Christians on Sundays, but all week round. Just like the disciples then, isn't being Christian about how we live our lives, how we go about the everyday encounters and tasks that face us. In these, as well as in the prayers and hymns and reflections we share on a Sunday, 
We are called to worship God. We are called to serve God. Meeting together to hear the word of God and reflect on it. To pray together to give thanks or bring our worries before God. To sing, to share in Holy Communion when we can. All of these are important. They strengthen us. They can encourage and inspire us. They are where we find the sustenance we need. And then we leave our gathering, our sanctuary, to live in the world. And because we have been nurtured, because we have found sustenance, we can live God's love in the world and hopefully remember our calling to do so in all we say and do. St. Francis is famously quoted with these words, Live out the gospel in all you do, and if necessary, use words. Live out the gospel in all you do, and if necessary, use words. Living out what we learn from the gospel is about much more than speaking about it. It's about how what we hear transforms us. It's about the choices we make, fed by our faith. Jesus told his disciples that it would be by their love, by living in a loving way, that they would be known as his disciples, as Christians. Of course, we you don't need to have a Christian faith to live lovingly, to do good in the world. Other faiths encourage their believers in similar ways to live charitably and generously. And we all know people of no faith who live their life in similar loving and helpful ways. And for us, our faith can inspire us, can motivate us to do good, to live selflessly in the big actions and in the small, in how we treat others, in how we speak to and about others, even the ones we might disagree with, and in the things we decide to do. If we look back at the time of lockdown, we have seen so many examples of love lived out in our communities. We have seen strong support for the food bank and other appeals during this very trying time. And we have seen love in action. In the strong neighborhood support in all our villages. In doing shopping or getting medication or just walking the dog for someone who couldn't go out themselves. We have seen the establishment of soup lunches, lunches, both in Hamby and Gifford, to support people who were more isolated. We have seen many skilled people making masks and donating them. We have seen so much mutual concern and care. Phone calls to friends and neighbors to see if they were doing well. We've seen courage in the use of new technologies to stay connected. And I believe all of these really deserve huge acknowledgement and appreciation. In this time of need, we have come together as a community. We have lived out love in the world. And now that we are hopefully nearing an end to restrictions and a time when all will be as protected and safe as possible, we can look at what needs remain. We can look at where we can continue to love and serve God and the world. The prophet Micah writes, What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus tells us that we should love God with all that we are and that we should love those around us as much as ourselves. These are why the church is doing so much in supporting food banks, in trying to help refugees, in speaking out for the necessity to do what we can to save our planet. On another occasion, Jesus told a parable to the disciples. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison 
and you visited me. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Perhaps if the people of Nazareth had taken the time to listen to Jesus, they might not have dismissed him quite so quickly. But perhaps they experienced the love he preached themselves at one point or another, and then recognized the power of God within him and within the ministry and service to which we all are called. Amen. We sing again hymn number 509, Jesus Calls Us.
when we feel downhearted, burdened, cynical, help us, we pray. Help us to recognize your goodness, the beauty of your creation with which you surround us, and help us to find new strength in you. We pray with all who are in pain today, pain of illness, pain of grief or loneliness, pain of injustice or fear or hunger. We pray that we may see where we can help, where we can make a difference. We pray with the places in the world where there's unrest, violence, war, and ask for your healing and your peace. We take a moment to think about all the people and situations on our minds close to our hearts today and hold them in prayer before you. God, in your mercy, hear all our prayers that we bring to you today. Inspire us, encourage us, so that we may live as disciples today and every day. Amen. We close our time of worship this morning by singing hymn number 511. Your hand, O oh God, has guided. <coughs>
preach the gospel in all that we do and walk with God in the spoken and the unspoken. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore.